credibility issue. Uh, I'll just carry on. It says continue. Um, and someone is a bit more premeditated, which is really what conduct disorder really is. And then oppositional defiant disorder is a kind of in between the two, really. They kind of the ones that pushed back. And that's really what I want to do. I think I want to try and demystify the terms, I look at the traits and then look at how we support them. And this is kind of one of two parts, because the first part tonight is really setting the scene and demystifying the terms and giving you some ideas about what to do in the now. We've got something coming up on the on the 8th of July, I think, on a Thursday, which is basically the second part of this session, which is really looking at the rest of the approach that we would look at in terms of meeting their needs. So I'm just going to sort of mention the website. Um, I've got some bits and pieces on there. If you want to see uh, a video of my parents, who uh, I think some of you might have come across over the years, they were uh, fairly well known for a while because my mum particularly had run uh, 113 marathons starting off when she was 50. And I think uh, when, when she was um, um, essentially doing her 100th marathon, this was quite big news. In fact, when she did her 100th marathon, I did my first. This was uh, when she was um, 75 and I was 50. And, um, and my dad's run 25 too, but he gets no credit for this because she's run 113. But it was a 100th marathon. Anyway, she did, she did um, you know, it was quite big news, I think, because of her age. There was, there was a headline in, um, in, in the national paper in Ireland, you know, the, 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 the Irish Times. And, and on the back page, it had a picture of her saying, super granny, because what happened was, you see, she did it in four hours and, and 22 minutes. And, and um, I did it in four hours and 25 minutes. So the headline in the back paper had a headline saying, super granny completes a hundredth marathon strap line, then waited for her son and husband to join us. So that wasn't really good. Um, got a Twitter account as well. I've just posted some um, sendcasts actually, or podcasts. And I know these are becoming more popular now. So if you want to go on to that, Twitter thing, you can get us podcasts. And this is a little bit of the selling stuff, I suppose, but Ken mentioned I've written some books. They're mostly for teachers. Uh, as Ken said, I was essentially a head teacher and I mostly uh, wrote those books for teachers working with children um, in school situations. Uh, but I've been writing more for parents over the last few years. And I've got a couple of books that are coming out um, at some stage uh, this year, one on attention difficulties and then I've got some ebooks as well, which are, are more for parents really on my website. And um, also presentations have changed. I think we've been, I'd normally be doing this live with you, uh, although it might not be always in the same place. I have gone on tour, so to speak, and, and gone to different parts of, of the country. And I have been down to the South and to the West and, 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 and obviously to the East, um, but obviously we've got this different reach now, but there's some webinars there I have as well, which are on that site. So I think, However way you cut the mustard, whatever you call it, and whether you call it ADHD, ODD, BBC, MTV, what we're really talking about, in my view, are three areas to support. That is learning, which essentially is how they respond to situation, particularly not just at school, but obviously learning some of the sort of ways in which they, they can react to situations with their siblings and, and they, you know, and with you. Um, obviously, the, the, the socialization, which is really crucial because that obviously is really important, particularly just go back to siblings here. If they're not getting on with their siblings, that can cause all sorts of issues. And also within a school circumstances, if they're, if they're not uh, uh, having friendships or, or they're being bullied uh, or they're being excluded or, or not included at least, these things, the learning and the socialization elements will really affect their behavior. Now, I always think people always come to me and ask me to talk about behavior, but really, the behavior is usually a, a reaction to, um, to things that aren't happening for them in those two other areas. So, you know, really, we've got to be getting, you know, if we, if we, can, we can understand how they learn and better understand how they learn and to a certain extent, understand how to negotiate and support them in socialization um, sort of sectors. That, in theory, should, 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 should help, uh, you know, minimize or affect the, the behavior. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on the term itself. A lot of people here tonight will be very experienced. They'll have been to uh, other talks or, or, or read books or, or they certainly, uh, you, you, you know, you're obviously experiencing it. 
So I'll just say it's called a developmental disorder. I don't like that term. If I had a way of changing it, I would be calling it, you know, this ADHD, I'd be calling it attention developmental hyperactivity difference. That's what it is. It's a developmental difference. And it's interesting, once you get that, that across, that developmental difference across, particularly if you understand what that means, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, always you know, change things overnight, but it gets you to understand why they do things differently than what you would expect them to do. And this is very, very true, particularly in schools, if you can get the issue of developmental difference across, because what that essentially means is you've got a child who's nine or 10 or whatever one you're interested in tonight, then they might be nine or 10, that's what it says in their birth certificate, but they've got the skill set in certain features of a five or six year old, you know, in terms of their ability to listen and ability not to, to, you know, to, to wait their turn and their ability to sort of like, you know, to focus on stuff, you know, but they might also have a lateral thinking element of a 13 year old. And that will mean they will stand out. So what happens is, particularly in a school setting, you put people based on their age, thinking they're all at the same developmental stage. Well, some of them are, most of them are in fact, but some of them aren't, which is why that, that, they will, that will stand out. So essentially they call it a developmental disorder. It's a developmental difference. That's really what it is. And understanding that, I think, and, and accepting that, it will help us understand how to better support them. The other things on there you'll be aware of, um, you know, the, the idea that it falls off you at 15 or 16 isn't, isn't the case. What we're trying to do is narrow, we're trying to narrow the gap. So we're trying to get the gap nearer to, you know, what is expected of someone of that same age at that stage. So that's really what we're talking about. And we do think the reasons for these, these, um, these symptoms are neurological. What we do know, and this is something that I know you've probably understood on your own journey, is that genetic influences are also very strong. And it's not, um, not, it's not to say that you, you or, or your partner has, has the traits, but it's often the case that in some families that is the case. And which means that a child you know, who might need more support might be getting adults who aren't always themselves as organized possibly as they, they can be. That's not to say that is your fault or anyone else's, you know, anyway, anyone else is sort of judging you, but it's just making the point that it does have quite a genetic feel. So it might, might be the case that some of those influences have actually affected, if you like, some of their developmental um, progress. And that's not to me, but what I'm always trying to say, in, in particularly if I switch this around between home and school, which I will do a few times, if you're working with a child with ADHD, you could be working with a family, which means that where you can try and take the burden off the parents as, as much as you can, particularly, I always say things like homework and organization. What we do know is that um, the several changes in DNA composition can create the issues that we're associated with, with lack of you know, uh, impulse control and, and, and focusing ability. And we do think that dopamine and noradrenaline are those involved. Now this is, so this is a slide showing you genetic inheritance. It's showing you things that you are likely to inherit. So for example, it's a twin study showing you, and this twin study is showing you that if um, on, the, on the line there, it shows you that if you are, uh, you, you're basically 90% likely to be the same height as your parents. Did you know that? So you, it's a very high genetic coefficient. So you're 90% likely to be the same height as your parents. Um, so that means if you are six foot tall, it's very likely your parents are in the five eight, five nines category. If you are six foot tall and both your parents are five foot five, that there could be another explanation for that. And it might be a phone call sometime. But I'm just kidding. The point is it can happen, but it's a 90 percent ratio. Schizophrenia is up there in the 70s. Asthma is up there in the 40s. Breast cancer, unfortunately, is far too high in the mid 20s. But ADHD is up there in the 80s. So that genetic coefficient is something for us to bear in mind. So if things aren't working the way they should be, it could well mean that there is just not just a child necessarily having to change or adapt to situations. It could well be that there's something that we can do as well. In America, it's interesting, in certain states, they're in a different kind of uh, cycle to us. They will not assess children in certain states in the United States until they've assessed the parents. And and it's interestingly, you know, who, who's being offered things like the medication. It's been the parents offered the medication first on behalf of, you know, helping their child, so to speak. So it's kind of an approach that we aren't in that cycle. 
So the symptoms are there. I'm not going to go through them. You, you know it. You live with it. Um, we had the three presentations in attention or presentation type. That's your ADD and the hyperactive impulsive type. Those are the, the areas there. And for me, I always say the three core symptoms are up there, inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. But if I'm really honest with you, the hyperactivity gets, the, gets all the headline term, but that's kind of them. And you know, we don't wanna change them. We want quirky, we want sparky, we want people who think differently, we want people who act differently. The issues that we should be trying to support though are the inattention and, and predominantly for me, the impulsivity. Because it's those two symptoms or two traits that, you, that seem to me to be causing the issues. The lack of impulse control, the lack of being able to stop and wait before you leap. And also when it comes to focusing, when it comes to learning, if you can't focus for long periods of time, that is going to lead to difficulties. So that's the game plan. Um, assessment, I think if you are considering that this might be something that, that, that you are associating as a reason for your child's differences, if you've already gone through the process, the issue of assessment should be rigorous, it should be comprehensive, it should filter out other reasons that could be causing these, these, these traits, and it should have some of these sort of things involved, if not all of them. The assessment we did at our school, our school it was in um, South London, in uh, a place called Clapham, although it's too posh now, it's, uh, well, if you know South London at all, it's, uh, it's now called Clam. And that's beside a place that used to be called Ballam, which is now called Bullam, and then Streatham is St. Reetham. But my point is that the school is in that in that part of uh, part of town, and um, our assessment took oh, took six hours over two days. It was that thorough because we wanted to make sure. Now I know many assessments aren't that aren't haven't got that length of time, but I, I look back now and I think about you know how comprehensive that assessment was, and the reason for that is you're trying to analyse what's the best fit because there could be other reasons, you know, that, that better explain the traits we're looking at. And that's what we're gonna try and ravel a little bit tonight because it's really important for us to understand what are the core traits or symptoms before we can best try to support them. Some of the tests that you may use or some of the screening tools. And what are these are there for? They are there for to compare your child in comparison with their peers at the same age and stage. And that's the, what we're trying to do is ascertain the developmental differences based on his actions, based on his expectations at a certain age in comparison to their peers. Um, information that you can sometimes get, you can get some neuroimaging, which can show some um, evidence, if you like. I know sometimes people like this kind of visual. They want to see that there's evidence that someone is wired differently. It's not always done, but it's something that sometimes skeptical people need to sort of see this sort of thing. Otherwise they start saying it's something that, you know, it didn't happen at home or it's the sugars or, or it's the food or it's grand theft auto. They start making those kinds of assumptions of other reasons why the child or the person is acting in a, in a, in a, in a non-traditional manner. Um, that's the sort of the biochemistry involved. And we know that, um, Medication can sometimes support this mechanism. Medication doesn't cure anybody. It might help someone who has no impulse control hesitate a bit longer and focus a bit longer so he or she can make a different decision about what they do. If you couldn't play the guitar before you took medication, you won't be able to play the guitar afterwards, but it might help someone teach you how to play the guitar. That's the bottom line. Dopamine is the neurochemical we think which is uh, not working efficiently and noradrenaline is the other one. So I'm not going to dwell on this stuff. Many of you will have re re researched this yourself. And we know that this area which is causing the difficulties is in the prefrontal cortex area. And there's four general areas up there. We think that this mechanism is not working efficiently. Okay, I just want to talk a little bit about boys and girls and the ratio. Um, the ratio it is more boys than girls. We don't quite understand why that is. It does seem to be that in most SEN areas, there's more boys than girls. And it could well be that there is, you know, a reason, an explanation for that. We haven't come along yet. But the ratio of boys to girls is about three to one. It used to be seven or eight to one. I do know the reason the ratio was so high in ADHD is because many girls 
don't fall into the hyperactive impulsive area they fall more into the hypoactive inattentive type and that's why the ratio was so skewed in fact in the area of inattentive adhd there are more girls than boys but adhd does exist in girls as well and again but for many reasons and, and also probably similar to asd the girls either mask them or they're not as seen as as more as obvious by people around them. There's a character, obviously Phoebe Buffet, you know, played by I can't remember her name now, or Lisa Kudrow, and they're all back together again. There's a character, isn't there? If you watch Friends, then you appreciate the fact that this is someone who's an adult, a bit quirky, you know, and some of those characteristics will be manifested differently in girls than boys. Um, and if you go through the rest of the characters, I know they're characters, but, you know, look at Monica. It's been on the uh, on the OCD side, isn't it, really? And you've got the brother, Ross, a bit in the dinosaurs, the whole Geller family. Uh, and uh, and then you've got uh, and then you've got Rachel, Jennifer Aniston, who's um, who's pretty much perfect, really, isn't she? In every 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 single way. Anyway, moving on with girls, I think some of the issues you may have with girls Maybe more difficulties with things like organization and planning. They might have some of the other issues you're experiencing with boys as well in terms of acting out. But often if they've mastered it, often it really kicks in, particularly when it is into the secondary area, where sometimes now that that skill set in terms of organization and in terms of socialization will be found out. So for girls, it can sometimes be a slightly different journey. Oppositional defiant disorder. Now, I know you've got um, uh, some issues that you might really see this as being a big problem, but we're going to say you but, but there is always a solution to someone's, you know, there's always a, there was always a silver lining because, yes, they are very good at what they do, because these are the individuals who do show these characteristics. Um, but know this, you know, they these are also the defense lawyers of the future or um or ryanair cabin crew so everyone's got a role okay they're very good at what they do uh, they're very good at pushing back um they're excellent in fact you know in fact that's what they do best now to a certain extent it's going to be something which living with this and working with this is not straightforward i get that but like everything else there is a way of supporting people who have these traits and there is an outcome for someone also who has these traits if they can be honed and and supported in the right way so those are the first three so it basically says at least four from any of the following categories and a lot of these areas are again said to be you've got to exhibit four out of these eight or whatever one two three four five yeah that is eight over a period of six months the maladaptive and inconsistent with development level so you're not doing this you know on on the odd occasion you're doing this a lot you're doing that that much more than should be expected of some Eurasian intelligence in comparison to your peers and in two or more places i'll come back to that later on in the questions because that sometimes can be a little bit unhelpful because sometimes if you get everything right in one area and not in the other you won't always see the same the same degree of symptoms but anyway that's the essential so it's four out of eight of those and again just showing you there you actually in this particular area they do talk about mild so they are actually talking about it because with an adhd you have to exhibit in two or more places with oppositional defiant disorder they are saying that they can diagnose it if it is in one setting moderate would need would need to be at least in two settings and severe as the three so oppositional defiant disorder you actually have a little bit more flexibility in one sense about the one setting situation whether whatever you call it, you can call it odd bbc mtv the traits are real and it's something that i think we will need to talk about in terms of how you support it there's a clue early on by the way in terms of some of the descriptor i'm going to come back to that in a minute one of the causes of ODD, uh, for me, I think it's frustration, but other reasons are up there. You can read through. I think it is generally frustration. I think opposition to fight disorder is a is underlying issues that we haven't really understood or we're not meeting. Um, but you know, are some children born with an ability to push back? You know, that's a, you know, it's debatable. You know, I think the jury would be out on that. 
I think that it's more a case, I think, of, of, of something that has happened as a result of, but, you know, we don't, you know, we could be wrong on that. I think what I would say is that um, the ways in which you manage support them will need to be different. And I think, you know, some of the sort of ways in which you might have brought up other children will need to be revised here. I know that I have some experiences both as a parent and certainly as an educator where I had a lot of different approaches to individuals who were different. And this book, which is by Douglas Riley called um, The Defiant Child was very helpful for me. It's quite a dated book now. It's about 26 years old, 20, sorry, 20, about 22 years old. But essentially some of those issues there are ones I'm gonna come back to. But some of those, some of those bullet points were very useful for me in adapting how I approached individuals who had these traits. Because the thing about training or what we're we all calling this tonight, this isn't what to tell you what to do, it's to try and like sp you, to get you to maybe think of how to sort of do things differently. Or it might be confirming what you're doing is the thing to do, you're just gonna do more of it and be more consistent with it. You know, but I think, you know, if you're expecting a magic formula, it doesn't really happen. Although I do have a formula, I'm not sure if it's magic, but it might be something which is more of an approach. I'm afraid it's the old adage that it's not inspiration, it's perspiration. And the one I like best about all this is Gary Player hit a long part years ago and, uh, you know, to win an open or something. And the, the, uh, the commentator said, Gary, so that's a very lucky putt. And Gary Player turned around and quick as a thing, he said, yeah, he said, the more I practice my putting, the luckier I get. So I'm afraid it is about that perspiration versus inspiration. But some things can help you maybe make that perspiration more productive. Now, conduct disorder is, is more gritty, and, and, and it is. It, there's aggression in there, there's a lack of empathy, and it's got some of these characteristics. And it's important for us, if we are talking about non-premeditated impulsive behavior, to be squaring the circle, so to speak, to be talking about what is more premeditated behavior. What we don't want to be doing is, is, is necessarily is using the same approach that we would do for impulsive behavior towards someone who is premeditated. Does that make sense? And that's why we need to do it. So although it might not be a term that you like the sound of, at least it's, it's important for us to understand there's a different rhythm. And it's not something we talk about very much because it is gritty. Again, four out of the following to be present. And again, it's got to be over a period of six months and, you know, in, in comparison to peers. And, and, and basically, and it says at the bottom there, it's caused significant impairment in functioning, liver process scores. The difference here is, is really, as I said, is that it's, it's the premeditation and the lack of empathy. You know, whereas with children with ADHD, for example, you know, the first time they think about what they've done, they've already done it. Whereas children with conduct disorder know what they're doing and kind of do it anyway. I'll tell you what would be an example. If you get a in a, in a in a classroom scenario in particular, so you turn your back around and a kid throws a pen across the room, the one with ADHD you can spot. And the reason is because he was bored, he got, he got tired, and he just got fidgety. And if he tries to cover up and, and, and says he's, he's just not a very good, he doesn't sequence very well. He's not a good liar because he didn't really plan to do it. He's impulsive. He can walk right through his story. And generally, he's probably quite sorry for, for doing it anyway because he didn't really mean to think about doing it in the first place. The, 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 the child with conduct disorder knows what he's doing. He's got an alibi. He's thought it through. Very hard to catch him. His, uh, his alibi will usually be the kid with ADHD sitting beside him. He's usually the one that gets it. And he's like, well, what was it me? I don't know. Anyway, but he uses him anyway. He kind of, you know, he kind of, he's the sort of like, he kind of controls, you know, that sort of stuff. That's true, actually, when it comes to uh, criminal justice system, it comes out another time. But these are the leaders of the gang. These are the leaders. These are the ones who don't catch because they're clever. They're the ones that are premeditated. I'm afraid that the people who get caught are the people who are more impulsive and, and stuff. But, but anyway, and then the one with compositional fire disorder is a bit in the middle. He's um, he's throwing the pen. He's harder to spot than the one with ADHD, but he's easier to spot than the one with conduct disorder. But it doesn't matter whether you spot him or not, because if you ask him publicly in front of his peers, did he throw the pen? He'd have twisted it all around and made it seem as if it was a really boring lesson, which is why he threw the pen in the first place. So you won't get much mileage out of them. 
So that's just to make that sort of like a, a bit of a, an example between the three. I think what I'd like to say to you, though, is that there is no such thing as ADHD children and there's no such thing as conduct disorder children or opposition to or true. There's just children who have traits. And I want to make that point. So they are children or young people first who have traits. And there's, uh, I don't know why this window is up here. I don't know if I can do anything about it or whatever. But anyway, those are the twins. If you ignore the window, you can see the pictures. It's a wedding. They don't normally dress them the same. Um, but there they are. It's, um, it's the wedding. And there they are. Those, uh, the, we, we call them Ronnie and Reggie. We thought that would be a, a useful way for them to negotiate, um, you know, having red hair in the playground. But not actually. There's, uh, there's Connor and Brennan. We wanted to keep with the, uh, with the lineage there. Uh, left hand side is Brennan. And the right hand side is Connor. And um, so when it comes to this issue of uh, innateness or, or someone having a little bit more of a, a sort of an attitude, which is half full, I would say it's a little bit of nature and a little bit of nurture in there. I'm just going to make that point there. Those are the boys. Uh, I'll just show you my daughter as well. She's uh, they, these are all they're, they're 22 now and she's 24. And, um, and there's Kendall, she's had to deal. So I know a little bit about the sibling stuff, you know, having moved, uh, having worked and lived in that area for a while. But I thought it was interesting about her, it was, it was my daughter's assessment on, um, on uh, socialization. I'm gonna make this, make this point about for girls. So the problem with boys don't take anything seriously. And the problem with girls, they take everything too seriously. My point is that the socialization, socialization issue sometimes for girls is that much more difficult if you are different. That is the point. And I think for boys, that issue of socialization can be problematic, but often boys can kind of sort of go into the machine world to communicate with girls. You've got to be part of the pack. And we're, we're going to cover that more in, in session two. It's not something we can, we, we don't have to discuss tonight in the question and a. Um, overlap is the norm, it's not the exception, um, and overlap with ADHD does happen with other, other areas too. You've seen conduct disorder, oppositional refinement disorder, it may well be that your son or daughter with these traits falls into some of those, that middle area or middle areas, or they might be, they might be a, you know, more in one area or the other. The two other areas that often overlap would be, a, would be attachment disorder, which is more of a nurture issue and to a certain extent, ASD and PDA. So we'll talk about those very quickly. Making the point, nature and nurture, you know, it's something that I think we, um, we, we kind of talked about before. But attachment disorder is a little bit more about the nurture. Um, and again, does it, 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 once, you, once you've got the child, you have to manage the issues. So it's no matter what you call it, but it's about managing the issues. But some of the traits, if you like, of attachment disorder or some of the issues with that and some of the ways you can support it, you know, that's really what you want to try and do. It, it might be things like eye contact. It might be things like trust with an adult. It might be some of the other techniques you use. And there are some very useful things you can pick up from talking about meeting traits, if you like, than terms. The other term that often does overlap is ASD. And uh, ASD for me is someone that has a social communication, imagination, black and white, don't do the gray. Um, what else I would say really pretty inflexible. You know, those sort of things can sometimes, you know, be difficult for us to uh, always understand, but trying to understand their world is really important, I think. And I think once you get into that kind of understanding where they're coming from, I think a lot of what they do might make more sense. I think the issue of not being flexible is generally important and they're not flexible anyway. When they get stressed, they're going to be less flexible. And I think if you go in and, and you are inflexible, if you're meeting someone who's already inflexible, it's like a North Pole versus North Pole and that will repel. The most important thing with ASD, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a recurring theme in all of these things, is reduce the anxiety. If you increase the anxiety, and that is true very much of the other areas too, and generally speaking, it's not going to help matters. Generally speaking, it's going to make them somewhat worse. But it's making PDA, it's the sort of a ODD with ASD, really. You often see diagnosis of uh, ASD and PDA, and you see ADHD and ODD. What you don't see is ASD and ODD, not very often. You might have an example of that. 
or PDA uh, or AS ADHD and PDA is often seems to go with ASD, at least does over here. What I want to talk to you about though, and it's the central word, I've made it very big in black. It's the word mood, because I'm going to make this point now. It's going to come to you later on, but we aren't talking about managing their behavior. You know, that behavior is a too complex a word. It means too much to do with people. The most important thing when it comes to supporting children, both with ODD, PDA, ADHD, CD, BBC, MTV, would be mood. And, and supporting mood is going to be a central point that I'm going to sort of try and get across during this talk. And when I've done talks before with parents, and I used to run a parent support group for a four-week course. So we're doing this in one two hour sessions we used to spend uh, we had a four week course which was uh, 16 hours um and, and even then you know we only scratched the surface but when we came back to talk about what really helped families that were going through this this journey um the majority came back and said it was this issue about supporting and, and changing and managing mood so that's my that's my research on that really and i hope that you know we, we get the opportunity to test that out with yourselves both today and next time we, we meet. Um, I'm making the point that, um, you know, it, 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 it doesn't always go right, it can go wrong. Um, and if you're experiencing that, that tension and stress now that it's going wrong, I think what we all know is that the earlier intervention, the better recognition, then we can support and minimize the effects of those things taking place. For example, oppositional defiant disorder for me doesn't happen too early on. It happens later on when they start thinking, well, the best I can be is the worst I can be. It's the best I can be. They start pushing back. So what we want to try and do is minimize that issue. Uh, and not to say it's always possible because of, of this, that and the other circumstances, you know, the level or the, the severity of the symptoms, because we can all have mild, moderate and severe. It can happen. So um, the point is that, but the earlier we get in, but I want to make the point as well that, you know, what we do need, we need people who are different and we need people who think differently. And it's interesting that schools want people who are conforming to type. They want people to do the same thing in the same way all the time. Business wants innovation. They want difference. They want someone who's intuitive. They want someone who's quirky. They want someone who thinks differently from other people. So to make that point, getting them through this school period is tough, but at the other end, if we can get them through this, then we need the people who think differently because they're the people who do stuff that, that we can all benefit from. And I was try I have all the sort of like the standard ones I was going to show you tonight. I was going to give you a quiz. And I was going to show you all the people, but I just couldn't resist a picture that I saw uh, about a couple of years ago of someone who's different. And I know that um, he, he doesn't necessarily get... Um, uh, how can I put it, that, 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 that I've always a positive recognition, but oh, can you look at that face? I mean, look at, just look at that face for a minute. Now, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you've got to say that despite everything, you know, he, it's a fairly successful company, or it was, but I want you to look at, I, I normally do this, with, like, I want you to look at that face just for a minute, and, 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 and what do you think he'd have been like to... Um, to parent, you know, or, or, or for that matter, to, to teach. I think he'd always done what he was asked to do when he was asked to do it. I, I imagine not. I imagine there'd be some challenges in the, um, in the, and the, the, you know, the, in the O'Leary house. Okay, so look, you know, I'm trying to um, give you a little break here now because it is that time. I know I can't remember this window. If I I sort the window out by the time we come back we might lose this and we're going to send you all the slides anyway so you'll get a proper handout of that you're just going to have to sort of look at it and go buy through it so i didn't have a magic formula for you but i have a formula for you but what i want you to do is i do want you because you've been sitting a busy day already so what i want you to do is get your hands out in front like that just do a little bit of a stretch i'm no no joe wicks or anything but i used to used to be a sports teacher so then once you've done a bit of that you put your hand there behind you back your head yeah like that bit of movement and a bit a little bit a little bit to the to the to the left well, it's my left you're right and that, that, that bit like that and again just to get you going stand up if you want to just a little bit of a stand up thing just to do that if i stand up too much you see i'll be wearing shorts i haven't worn a pair of trousers you know for about a year and a half actually 
Um, and then we can do a little bit what we do in rugby just to get you going. Do a little bit of this, go a bit forward, what we used to do in the changing rooms, get going. And then a little bit going back. Of course, you know, while we're doing this, the backs, we were, you know, the forwards were like doing all this stuff. I don't know why they were doing that. We're going to get someone to do that some in a minute. Well, we were just brushing our hair because we wanted to look good. But anyway, a little bit of movement. No magic formula. I wish I could tell you was. But we're going to call it, we've got an approach, we call it SF3R. And again, the feedback I've been getting over the years that this has been useful. S stands for structure. F stands for flexibility. And the three R's are how you sell it, support it and sustain it. Now, I understand that, you know, you might not, this might not always come across uh, straight away. And unfortunately, because of the time we're going to spend tonight, we're going to do the S and F before we got to the R's. I want to give you the ground ground rules and then I want to talk about how we sell, support it and sustain it. But if someone hasn't been used to any structure and has, has kind of really fallen off the uh, off the wagon, so to speak, on that, it's not going to happen overnight. But I'll show you the principles of what you can do. And then we're going to talk about how we can try and get it across. So number one in the structure, we can all better understand our children. We can all better understand them by understanding the conditions or the terms that, that actually we think are mostly responsible for how they react. We can all also understand, you know, that they have areas of strength and weaknesses and try and support the strengths and try and make up the weaknesses. And we can all do better with our rules and rituals. We can all do better. And I don't just mean them, I mean us too. Flexibility sounds like it, it, it contradicts structure. It really doesn't. It complements structure. And uh, I'm not going to dwell on all of those, but I'm going to make that big point about that one in the middle, mood and motivation. But I do, I do some parents um, and consultancy, individual parents, and I always say that one thing I'm going to do is we're not going to talk about behaviour. I'm going to sort out the mood. I'm going to sort out the mood. Then we're going to go motivation. I'm going to get direction. And that's what we do. Mood, motivation, direction. Working collaboration with professionals, the village raises the child. You know, that's been around for a long time because it's true. Now, who those other villagers are, there will be a variety. It could well be a, a professional or it could well be, uh, you know, other elements of, of your network that can help support individuals who won't take it from you. Because that's what it's always been. And if you've got a teenager in particular, that's been something that we've understood for centuries, which is why we've always had the elders or the wise men in the group, you know, because teenagers have always thought their parents, you know, didn't know anything. In fact, always, if you've got a teenagers, then you've got to, you've got to read um, Mark Twain. Mark Twain, he, he's good. He said, uh, he said, when I was 14, I thought my parents knew nothing. But when I got to 21, I was surprised how much they'd learned in seven years. So that's for not teenagers anyway. You've got someone who's got developmental differences. It's going to be and some. So the three R's are rapport. And it's going to be something that we are going to be do doing more of in the next time. But we will, again, mention this in the quote Q&A tonight. It's about communication. It's about, you know, not just what you say, it's how you say it. It will be to do with some ideas about structure, you know, frustration, defiance. Um, it's also going to be about relationships. It isn't just between us and them. It's going to be between them and them. And that's going to mean, you know, um, advocating sometimes on behalf of the others in the situation, which are peers and siblings. And it will be to do sometimes with communication to Muhammad. And the final one is resilience, where you take the stabilizers off, where therefore they become more independent and less dependent. So... Those are, the, those are the areas we're going to go through. This is the, the approach we're going to do, this SF3R. So uh, if you're hanging in there for a moment, then uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to look at the S and the F. Now, I know at the moment as well, you've um, just, uh, I'm not going to do a twirl around here, but you could be looking at my room, aren't you? Looking at what's on my bookshelf. And uh, you look at your bookshelves, don't you? Because you're distracted, aren't you? A few of you. So uh, what have you got? Can you see there? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a ball. There's a ball from, uh, I got from France a few years ago, because I know you've been looking at it. So there you go, there's that. There's my uh, my worry monster. There, there's that one there. I don't know if you can see, you can probably see, uh, you can see my box set up there. You can probably see that. Yeah, that's the, uh, yeah, you've spotted that, haven't you? I know some of you, it's the Game of Thrones box set. Yeah, all right, I'm not going to deny it. I, I didn't know much about it. And my, I used to do a lot of stuff on trains. 
And my daughter said to me, she said, Dad, she said, you should watch this. It's really good. And I said, what is it? Like, it's all about, you know, there's like, you know, swords and all sorts of stuff and dragons and stuff. And I thought, OK, well, so anyway, I got my got my got my um, I got my um, my laptop on on a train because I'm a lot of time on trains and I, and I put it on and I had to shut it down because you just can't watch Game of Thrones in, in you know, on a public transport. OK, so it's not a formula. It's an approach. It's an approach. It's an approach which will mean that all these are cogs in a wheel. There are cogs in a wheel in terms of what you do and you will need to do it together. If only one of you is doing it, it is, it's not going to work as effectively. So you've got to buy into it if it's going to be something that you feel is right for your family. So structure is, you know, it's going to be these sort of things. It's, you know, and that's what structure does. It reduces anxiety. It's a myth, actually, that people don't like structure. In fact, the people who fight structure the most, in my experience, they, they need structure the most. Which is why, for example, over here at least, if they leave school or they're excluded from school, what do they do? You know, they're in a, they're in a school system. What do they do? They join a gang. What's a gang? It's just another another form of structure. You know, you've got a hierarchy, and you know, and 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 there's other gangs you can get involved with. By the way, if they're not involved in the school gang, that's football, rugby, cricket, you know, or whatever, or in fact, you know, you know, a hurling or Ameri you know, a Gaelic football or or a band or or. A, or you know some other kind of like team that they're involved with. It's not just sport. It can be something. It can be music. It can be arts. It can be someone else that they're good at. Just get them in a different gang. Um, what uh, what we talk about very much is not just telling them. It's about teaching them how to do stuff. And it's about building up routines and habits. And there'll be some new habits we have to get into because we've fallen out of them because of the COVID situation. And it doesn't mean that uh, people are, are going to be able to just lock back in. And, and just and telling someone that they should do something as opposed to helping them and understanding they need time to do it is something that can cause a problem. Over here in particular, you know, we've had an exclusion, explosion in our schools. It, was, it went right down, but exclusion in our schools has gone up 45% in fixed term and 33% in permanent over the last four or five years. And partly that's to do with, with this kind of low, no tolerance approach. But the danger of this after COVID is actually going to be more enhanced because some of the expectations on things like, you know, having non-impulsive behaviour towards social distancing, for example, and, you know, and without some kind of approach, which is taking that on board, you know, I can just see those figures going up and up. Now, what does it mean structure in the family? And it will mean different things for different people. And again, I don't have the time or the opportunity to talk about an individual family here tonight. But if I was, we'd be talking about having some degree of, so in some families talk about a reset. We talk about sitting down, starting again, talk about some of the things that you need to do as a family. And what that means is you need to have some expectations. You can call them rules. You can call them, you know, you can call them what you like. But the bottom line is there are some things that need to happen in order for you to remain a stable and safe family. And I think this would be just some of the ways in which you might go about doing it. Now, I'm not saying it could be it's these or it isn't these. It could be other areas as well. What I will say is that if you want to start off with something, you have to make it achievable and it has to be something that you can, you're ready to enforce. Because the thing is that if, if it's not a rule unless you enforce it. Uh, and, it and, if, and if you say something, like for example, if you do that one more time, you can't have your Xbox for the rest of the week, and it's on a Monday, well now you've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and now you've got to follow it through because you've said it. Because the most important thing about this is not is, you know, it's not the severity of what you do, it's the certainty. If you say it, you must follow through. And you might not be able to do what you say you do, if that makes sense. So you need to make sure that you've considered areas which are practical and enforceable. So for example, let me just show you, and then once it's done, you've got to like maybe put it up somewhere, you can all see it. And even if they don't give you the impression they're looking at it they look at it when you're not seeing them look at it and those are some things that we can again spend a bit more time on the escape hatch is just giving them somewhere they can go at certain times but it's where i'm going to so when you work with my work with families they want to say to me they want, they want to say well we don't stop the shouting and fighting but you can't stop that overnight. 
what you can do is you can have a reset by saying that there's some non-negotiable. See, band one is your structure, okay? These are the things that, whether you're ADHD, ODD, BBC, MTV, non-negotiable. And start off with things that you can actually visualize and see. No shoes off in the house. Food remains downstairs. It's nothing about food. It's about the fact that if you're downstairs, you can eat food. If you're upstairs, you can't. For children that have fallen out of the idea of structure, it's a tangible start. Meal times, meet and training. You know, when I was in a school years ago, I had to sort of minimize the impact of all these kids who were fighting and screaming and things like that. And it was an international school and, uh, and the kids didn't wear a uniform. And what happened was they leave the playground, they go upstairs into the class and it was like chaos because they hadn't identified the difference between the classroom and the, and the playground. And it was an international school. I had a lot of Americans in this school because it was this international school I first went to. In London and they all wore baseball hats and they all chewed gum all the time and they were still chewing gum and wearing baseball hats in the classrooms and no one was prepared to do anything about it and of course we never had any real momentum after that so we started off with not just talking about the shouting and the swearing we talked about no no shoes no sorry no shoes on there no hats on the building and no gum and everyone had to reinforce it and it wasn't popular it wasn't popular but once we got that established that created an expectation and a difference that once you're in the building, there's a different, there's a different set of things going on. And it, and it didn't stop everything overnight, but that started to reduce all the issues that we had after that. So once you get your non-negotiables, I'm not saying it's these ones, but you've got to have something which is clean that you can see because no fighting, no shouting, no screaming, no swearing. You don't know who started it, you know, who wound him or her up in order for him to react that way. But if you get that kind of structure, so your structure is on, on band one, your flexibility is on band two. And by the way, calling out, slamming doors, these aren't crimes against humanity. I wanna make that point. Um, eye contact again, that's a flexible one. It's not a crime against humanity not to look at you when you're talking to someone. I know it's annoying, but I'll come back to that. If they're doing this, they're listening to you. That's what you want to do, listening to you. That's in the flexibility section. When it comes to schools, I would do a similar sort of model, but we're not doing schools today. But again, it might be something that you can transfer and we can get organized if there's schools that aren't buying into this. What's really important though, in like in anything else, is not what you do, but how you do it. So your approach to this is going to be crucial. Now, I've done this as a little bit of a game, and we're going to go for another 10 minutes because I know that you must, you know, want to in, in, interject with me, but I want to get a few other things across before we get into the QA. But your style will be important. And if you notice, you've got three main styles: you've got a controller, you've got a friend, and you've got a benign dictator. Look at that. You've also got a grumbler, an optimist, competitive one. Yeah, yeah, you've got those. So, um, controller, seeing like her, it's too tight. It's my way or the highway. It doesn't work for a lot of individuals we're talking about tonight. It leads to that. It leads to tell them what to do, threaten with consequences, send them to your partner. And when that doesn't work, there's no plan B. Um, the friend is the opposite extreme. Children need nurturing like buds on a flower being nice and friendly. It's too democratic, it's too open-ended, it's, it's, it's just too loose. And it leads to that, it leads to uncertainty. I can tell you what I have learned over the years, and I've been doing this now for like, I don't know, 40 odd years, that the most important thing that children want is to feel safe. And I don't care what area we're talking about, they want to feel safe. And the students who come to the school, I say to them, who's your favorite teacher? And they say, oh, I hate all teachers, or they've been excluded from so I said, well, who was the teacher you hated less than the other ones? And I'll say, oh, I don't know, someone you knew you were with, you know, someone who, uh, who could sort out the other kids and, and someone who could have a laugh with. What they wanted was someone who was, you know, firm, actually. Uh, what they saw was, you know, fair, you know, and consistent and someone who, could, who was funny. So what they want essentially is a, someone who's a bit of a, benign dictator or leader would be like a call so setting the tone you've got to set the boundaries they're going to test them they're going to make mistakes um you have to be prepared sometimes to be unpopular to get the job done um you've got to dissociate the problem from you know it's no such thing as a problem child you've got a child not making good choices and that thing with the comes to the siblings will be an issue 
fairness is never the same as giving them what they need. And, and that is right, because certain people will need more than others at this time of their lives. As long as we get the sibling in the loop on this issue and that you are aware that there is time and options for them also, but at this time, it's important for us to be concentrating on him or her in order to get this family through. Benign dictator, therefore you hold them accountable, you create a culture of praise, uh, you do all this other stuff. You're a leader and a coach. Now, it doesn't sound very nice, is it a dictator but or more of a leader, but you wanna see a picture? There you are. So you can be loving and lovely. Look at how pretty that bear is. And look at a little polar, how loving that picture is. What's a polar bear got though that they need every now and again? They got claws and they got teeth. And that's important for us to, every now and again display but it's not how it's not what you do it's how you do it so because of that we're going to come to the magic word if there is a magic word it might be this this came from a long time ago when i went to a course and the guy was talking about behavior and when he was talking about behavior he got down to this term bds and no one knew what it stood and then people were saying i don't know british dental society or something he said it was bad day syndrome and i also thought it was a bit cheap at the time, I think I wanted something in meteor. I wanted brain dysfunctional, this, that, and the other. But when I came back, I started to think about it. And because we used to have situations where we had teachers, particularly, who was talking about a child saying that he or she was annoying, and other ones were saying, no, he's just overly enthusiastic. I'd be like, well, why do you see that? And why do you see that? So we stopped talking about managing behavior because I thought it was too abstract. We talk about managing mood. And when it came down to it, there were three moods that were crucial. Number one was the mood of the individual. And it's the old analogy of you being in a plane. You know, I've got the twins there. Yeah, you've probably heard this before. I've got twin one and twin two. And the oxygen masks come down quickly because you're all panicking a bit. And who's the pilot that it goes on first? And the answer is not your favorite twin. It's you. Because when you are breathing properly, right, you can then sort them out. And actually... The other, the second mask should probably not go on actually the one who is your most, it should actually go on the one who is the sort of like the other, because when they're calm, they then that will also make this one calmer. And that's what I mean. So for example, I go into a classroom, I go and I watch situations and I watch the teacher and watch their mood and who I'm really watching are two or three other kids in the class who are players. And what they do is the teacher's not looking, they turn around and they wind up the kid you catch. You know, like they, they, I call them players. And you got to get to them to minimise the impact of the one you want in there in the first place with. And that's the process. So it's yours, the others, and then the mood of the child. And when it comes to this issue of managing mood, it's not a secret anymore that other people are thinking about it too. There's a woman called Liz Miller who basically has discovered that you know, this is the, this is for her is the sort of like the, uh, the magic word too. And she wrote a book called Mood Mapping. And she talks all about it. It's a book I have over here actually on the wall somewhere, I'll find in a minute. And uh, but it's called Mood Mapping. And she talks about mood in a way that, you know, she talks about the agents of mood, she's talking about your surroundings, your physical health, your relationships, your knowledge, your nature. And, and these are the agents of mood. And these are the ones that we would work through with you um, in terms of your approach and how you can better manage and support the mood options in your circumstances. And when it comes down to it, you have these other areas really to consider. And when you are in that top right hand quadrant, that's when you are in your most positive quadrant in that area. So it's something we can, we'll talk more about and we will um, discuss more both in the Q&A tonight and also next time we meet. I think essentially, though, the next slides are going, I'm going to go through quite quickly just to make the point that, you know, and we can come back to them as Q&As as well. But in terms of your structure, you do need to obviously have that meeting, you know, that reset meeting. Flexibility will include some of these things that you will need to look at. If you've got particular issues of comorbid issues of ASD, you need to look at some of the sensory stuff. And if you, once you start thinking about managing supporting mood, then this whole area opens up about things that affect mood. And it isn't just the people, it's the environment and things in the environment that can trigger different responses. 
And when it comes to someone that has sensory issues, such as ASD in particular, we know that these are some of the things that can also make a huge difference in terms of at least being preemptive and being and being you know and and and, and basically having thought about them before, which is, means the same word, I suppose. Um, you know, social stories, reducing anxiety. What's reducing anxiety? It's managing mood or it's supporting mood, or at least thinking about doing that. So, you know, letting them know what's going to happen in advance, that sort of approach, it's, it's reducing the anxiety. Um, you know, I would talk a lot more about some of these things had we time, but you're going to have to deal with particular issues of impulsivity. What I will say to you is that children with ADHD, it's very hard to sell this, particularly now at this time of night when you're feeling it, but they have a low threshold of boredom. And that's what I've noticed over the years. But the idea, but when they're interested in what they're doing and who they're doing it with, you get them right on the money. But that, that threshold of boredom is something that is real to them. And you can't just say to someone who's bored, be more interested, it doesn't work that way. You've got to understand that they are bored and understand the reasons for them being. I know some kids will say they're always bored, but I would talk to you a lot more about this other than the fact that you are bored right now and I need to get to the Q and A. Um, you know, some of the options you could use in terms of supporting them would be on this slide here. And again, uh, I'm just throwing this at you now as, as something again for us to discuss. And then some of the other things here about homework and organization, I'm gonna leave out right now. I'm gonna just say one thing about computers. They do appear to, we've got this idea that they take away attention. Here's the other way of thinking about it. They also hold attention. And again, when it comes to strategies of actually working with individuals who have poor seeing abilities, um, then, you know, what is it that they do? They allow them to focus. And again, I have some ideas about how we can use that in certain circumstances as opposed to reduce the computer. It's not about them being on the computer all the time, but it's about using the machine, if you like, in a proactive way. Um, I'm not a doctor, but what I am going to say is, and in my formula today, we talked about um, flexibility. And in that formula, the flexibility section talks about working with other professionals. So what I'm going to add to this is that, you know, with all the other things that you can do, sometimes you need something to support children you're working with to make a different choice. And that's where medication fits in for me. It fits in the F, it's flexibility. It's not in structure, it's because that's different. Flexibility is remember those things that you do to reinforce structure. So medication has a role. If someone really has difficulties in focusing and impulse difficulties, then you need to give them something to, to, to basically give them a chance to meet the needs or their expectations of that age and stage. What medication does is we think it helps across in this area now, but lots of pretty diagrams for you. But the bottom line is it gives someone who's not got that ability to hesitate long enough to take the choice to make a make a hopefully a better choice. Again, it treats core symptoms. If you've got all the other stuff that has come as a result of years of, of failing, it's not going to change it overnight. So that needs to be stripped away. That needs to be worked on. That needs to be sort of, you know, to reset again. But it might allow us other things to work more effectively. Um, different types of medications out there. We're not saying again that any one is better than others, but there are a variety of them. And if one doesn't work for whatever reason, then you have other varieties as well. So don't think you just have one. Ask the questions about the other options that are available. People ask me about medication a lot. And there's a slide over somewhere. This is about 20, how many years old is it? I forget how many years old it is. It's about, yes, 22nd of March, 85. It's a miracle. So what is that? So that's, what's that? 26, 27 years old? It's a 27 years old, this slide. Here's a child off medication, right? And it's the same child next day on medication. Now, when it works, it works pretty well. It, you know, it, it allows someone you know, the opportunity to put on paper what has been flowing through their mind. They just don't have the ability. Having lines, by the way, so medication with structure, that's a pretty good idea. Papers are all over this. They don't like it. They think it's, you know, it's, it's cheating or it's drugging children or, you know, chemical caution stuff. 
but they don't understand that, you know, what, what they're talking about, that you've got some word developmental difference who is co caused by neurochemistry not working. And if this can support them to make different choices, then and you read, I read the article a bit more. It said a boy, this is, and this was made mutable. So I thought that's not so good. So I read the article a bit more. It said this is before, this is a child before, this is before a child who used to, uh, I don't know, who was trying to set fire to things, trying to strangle the family cat and, and, and do all sorts of other stuff before became irritable after taking medication. So before it was all this stuff and then afterwards he was irritable. So it's not really that balanced really. So there's a before, there's an after. Here's a picture of the cat before the medication, uh, not looking too happy, picture of the cat after the medication. So the cat is happier, okay, that's my point. And I think that the house is calmer and I think people are being more productive and I think people are starting to meet their expectations. It's not where you start, but it's part of the process. In the end of the day though, it's very, this is the last slide, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. And that's the way we move into the rapport. You know, so it's structure and flexibility, that's all very well, but you've got to gain their trust. And that's what really we're going to be focusing on more in the next one. But obviously we can answer some questions on that tonight. I know it's been fast and a bit furious. It's been a long sticky day for many of you, but um, I wanted to get those, uh, I want to throw those things into the pot, so to speak, for us to discuss and to work through right now. Well, Dean, thanks very much for that. Um, and obviously, just uh, that's part one, and say part two, we'll pop that into the Q and A a little bit later. And um, just for myself, just in going back to the very, very start, and um, you know, we always work from the position that uh, ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition, so you're born with it and you'll die with it, and it affects you across your lifespan differently. And um, just specifically with AD or ODD, and um, you're like we're talking there, it has to be identified for six months, so. Does ODD come and go? Is it a lifelong condition? Okay, well, look, here's, here's the thing. Okay, you really got me. You've really put me on the spot here now because if I'm really honest, okay, here's the idea, right? Well, let me answer it another way around. You know, we have a term right now which we've, we've got for, uh, it's called PDA, pathological demand. A lot of people are talking about right now. It's not in the DSM-5, okay? But people are saying there's, there's, there's societies on it, people are diagnosing, it's not in DSM-5. So technically people are using the term, but it's not in DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. So what does that tell you? It tells you that it could well therefore be just a reaction to ASD not being treated. For me, if I'm honest with you, I think oppositional defiant disorder, if I'm really honest with you, although it's in DSM-5, I think it is a, is a frustration from underlying causes. So if you really want my, my approach on that, I don't think you're born with it. I don't think so you die with it. I think you, you, you exhibit those traits because underlying traits are something else is not being found. Very rare to get ODD by itself, right? Very rare. Often overlapping, often seems to be a consequence of. So what does that tell you? But it is in DSM-5, so I'm not, I'm not privy to, to disagree. Mm -hmm. If you want my guts, you got my gut feeling. I don't think it exists, really. I think it, it's a it's a frustration from underlying causes. That's my gut. Mm. But you know, things are changing all the time. You know, we might well find that it's a term that that falls away. I mean, there's a book that we've got over here. There's, there's a new term over here. You'll, you'll like this one. Someone's come up with a term for uh, what they called it. People gifted and talented. Remember that? I don't know if you remember that. That was around a few years ago. That didn't exist either, really. But it's back again. It's a new term now called ME. It's called multiple exceptionality. Someone's done two Venn diagrams, chucked them together, and called it this. You know, I, I <laughs> that doesn't exist in my opinion. Okay. But the traits of oppositional defiant disorder do exist and that's why i say mm. i think focus on traits as opposed to labels i think you'd be better off on that well thanks for that i mean um, i always thought i probably was I mean, multiple ex exceptionally but uh, probably i mean trisha and nick would probably go with the bds he's having bad day syndrome again yeah yeah um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well most people when you say you've got odd they go no i'm not yes i have no i'm not yes i have you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, you've got people 
who are good at arguing. That is the bottom line. And are good at pushing back. But the reason that intensity grows up is because I think there's underlying causes that they're, 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 they're trying to push back because they don't, they're not, we're not really dealing with what is the underlying cause, in my opinion. I'll say enough of there what I, what I think. Um, there, there's a lot of questions there we'd like to get through. So uh, I know Nick and Trish and myself have been going through them just when uh, they, they were coming in. So uh, maybe we'll just go to Nicola for the first question. Yeah, um, Finn, I have two questions that kind of overlap. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee and Tanya, um, one of them has a 14 year old son who has been diagnosed with ADHD about six months ago. And the biggest problem is that when he has an ex explosive uh, moment, he chases him around the house, looking for the answers, looking for a resolution um, with uncontrollable behavior and cursing. And how do they switch that explosive moment to allow them to cool down and for everyone to be able to cool down to do something with it. And Tanya kind of in the same vein as asking, what's the best way to discipline an ODD child? Um, talking doesn't work. So what's kind of one strategy you can throw at them that can say, no, take well, it from up here and bring it down to idea here. Again, about, you know, there isn't any one thing you can do to sort of stop this overnight. I think um, it's more of a, an attitude towards this. There's two, well, number one, you've got to look at, you've got to understand what are the triggers that are causing this to happen? I think that's important. You've got to analyze every time you have an issue like this, you've got to look at what were the triggers that led up to that particular issue. Okay. And then I think, you know, the, the issue is about if someone is running up out, running around the house, I mean, that's not by itself necessarily a problem if they are, you know, not causing damage or anything else. For me, I think you have to get back to this idea that it's about managing and, and his mood. And I think that if someone is in a really difficult mood and someone needs to get out, they need to get out. I think what would be better is, is finding somewhere where they go to when they're in that place. So I think there's a little bit of training to take place here about, you know, you've got to look at what are the triggers, first of all, that are leading up to this circumstances, see whether that can be something that can be done differently. But if it is happening, is a, a place that they go to or is there a, a process of which they go to to deal with their frustration? Because their frustration is real. So I think that's what you're looking towards. And then you're looking to sort of tie that to some, you know, um, outcome about how he makes the right choice or not right choice. So, you know, then you start putting some tariff in there about how he reacted in those circumstances and how many points he got for this and or, you know, what he gets for that. You know, so it's not a... It's not a, a one-off a magic thing you can do. The only way you can do that in a one-off thing is have a taser and take him out at that time he starts running, which is not legal. So you can't do that. So I'm afraid it's not a one-off answer. You've got to really have a process. You've got to look at start triggers. You've got to look at what he does when he's in that circumstances, get him to go or to a place which is safer and not as destructive if it is that way. And then I think, you know, once, once and have it tied to something, which is a tangible outcome, so he can see that he made better choices. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Richard. And there we go, um, just right down the road from myself to Marina and to Trisha. Okay, so Marie says, I've got a 13 year old who's refusing to interact with us. Once, sorry, am I still on mute? No, you're bad. Yeah, okay. Well, it was it wants to stay in the room the whole time on the Xbox. So many opportunities he would have, kiting, horse riding, etc. But he doesn't want to do anything. Um, so unpleasant all the time. Totally have losses we have to do. Where do we start? Well, I think number one is that it's not you go back to this issue of the machine and, and that, you know, I mean, again, this is a very common question, and you have all these other options out there. I think you've got to look at why is he the, the, the thing that I had there that slide I had on the machine is why do they like machines, right? Why do they like machines? Well, the machine is safer into a certain extent than a person because machines don't answer back. You know, they don't have a personality. They, they appear safer. Okay. The other thing is a machine is stimulating. It's got all the senses engaged in it. So machines aren't by themselves a negative thing they appear to, and also they hold attention for individuals who don't appear to have attention. So that's bizarre, isn't it? So no one has attention, they can sit in front of the machine for hours who, who, and, and, that can, and that can give them attention. 
So you've got to look again at what the machine is doing to get that. I think the, the, the short answer to your question is, is that, you know, you, it's, it's generally speaking, you know, something that he has acquired from you. Um, it's something that he needs to use which is based on the money that you pay for the electricity and all the other things that are going through, you know, you, it, it's not, you know, he doesn't have it all the time. That's just not how it's going to be. And, you know, there is a amount of time he has it, you know, per week, you know, or per night or whatever. So to a certain extent, you know, that means some degree of, that's going to, that's, that's going to mean it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. He's not going to like that. But that's how it works. You know, you are the benign dictator. You are in control, in control of a, of a remote control, so to speak. So, so what I'm saying to you is that you, you've got to understand that the machine itself is not a bad thing, but too much of that obviously is causing him and you some concerns. So there needs to be some agreement about how much time he has, you know, and, and some of the things that he is getting out of the machine or some of the con some of the concerns that he's that he's having about not being a machine need to be addressed elsewhere in his life and understood you know why that is happening and why it was a machine and all those other things sound lovely and, and and wonderful I'd like to do them but if he doesn't like to do them that's real for him uh, having said that structure I put that in on the band one is is one of the things you start with machine time how much time he gets. It's got to be done, you know, age appropriately, you know, the time he gets on per night, the time he gets per week, you know, and if it's two hours, it, it, it's two hours. It's not two hours and 10 minutes. Or if it's one hour, it's one hour. It's not one hour and 15 minutes. It's one hour. And then it's one hour. It's done. You know, it's got to be done that way. You, you, you've got to start back to those premises of training someone. You've got to remember why you're doing that. Because he or she, whatever age he is, is two or three years behind his peers in terms of what you would expect them to be doing. So it is about resetting all that, I'm afraid. But the, the two things to think about are what I said about machines. Why is the machine, why does he prefer the machine than anybody else? Because that's real. And then at the same time, it's not his machine. <laughs> you can see what I mean, really. Okay. Um, I did actually, one of the things I did write down myself was, you know, it's not the severity, it's the certainty. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things I certainly I'll be taking away from tonight. Um, I'd like to show just the next question, just a very first question that came in. Um, and how does an ADHD impulsive um, and oppositional directive defiant disorder um, in comorbidities act in real life for an eight-year-old girl? And could you give some examples? Um, and just, you know, forgive me for, for dating myself with the old Joe Jackson song, is it different for girls? Is it different for girls? I love the difference. I think, um, well, okay, let me give you an example. That, you know, there's a, there's a book by Steve Budoff saying that boys want to know three things. They want to know who's in charge. As Steve wrote the book called Raising Boys. Who's in charge? What are the rules? How are they going to be enforced? Whereas girls, it can be opposition fighters. Why are you in charge? Why are there rules? And let me stay up until 11 o'clock. It, you know, it, it's, it is different for girls in, in a way. And, and, it's, and it, if you say that this day, you're not supposed to say it. But girls can, can, can make it far more personal. Um, and, and, and with girls, they can um, be that much more challenging and, and you know, and, and, and really won't like you. <laughs> Whereas they don't like, they will like the really, and they will remember it, I think, a bit more. I think girls, can, and they're usually, usually more verbal, I think, is the issue. So I think, I think for girls, I think it's frustrating. But I would say, say for girls, the difference for girls, their frustration is usually, in my experience, is usually to do with socialization issues, especially when they're older with other girls. That's what you are facing usually as the parent. I always say as the parents, if they say they hate you, it's, it's not you they hate. You happen to be in the way. They're just expressing what they feel. They're expressing what they feel. And that's what they feel. It's not you they hate. They hate, probably, they hate the circumstances they're in or what someone said to them. But they're generally speaking more challenging in, in a verbal sense. Boys tend to be more physical in a, in, a, in a sense. But girls can be both too, you know. 
do boys and girls with improve as they get older as 18 plus look we go again to this whole idea about i know parents are always worried about that we've got a developmental gap in some areas right but there's an enhancement in others what we're trying to do is narrow the gap so the, the more support the more understanding the better we can understand the triggers the reasons for the triggers the better that we can be consistent about what we keep around them the, yeah, the gap will narrow. Of course it will. It will narrow. And, you know, but it's not going to happen overnight. Because I know that the questions we get are, it's like a one hit, you know, what can I do in this circumstance? What can I do there? And that is even, even possible to ask because what I might do in that circumstance is very different than, 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 than not so much like what you would do, but how I would do it would be different than you do it. Because people... Like, see what see this this myth about what medication medication doesn't doesn't cure people who have ADHD or doesn't what it does is it allows the people who are working with that person more time to exert their magic it's people changing other people does that make sense people change other people but people sometimes make make different choices they need to make more informed choices well, the, the only person's be mood that you can actually manage or actually manage or you can control to a certain extent is your own. Yeah. So if you can control how you approach things, if you can, you know, you could spend a lot of time on, on what you say, how you say it, where you say it, your body language, all that stuff. It doesn't come overnight to everybody. But the, once you start to, thinking about how you approach things, what you say, when you say, arguing, for example, I'll give you some top tips for ODD because people like top tips. Number one, opposition and fight disorder. It takes two people to have an argument, all right? Now, this is hard because someone is challenging you. You want to put them down in front of your peers or something else. Take an argument. I hate you, right? And it's very key to say, no, you don't. Well, no, you do. No, I don't. No, you do. I hate you. Yeah. All right. Sometimes I hate myself. Now, can you please go upstairs and finish your homework or whatever? You know, don't argue with an arguer. All right. That's number one. Number two, children with opposition fight disorder, they're into power and control. They want to be seen as if they're making the decision. So, for example, if the phone is up at the table at, 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 um, at, um, at uh, what do you call it, at, at dinner, you don't want the phone there, say to them, put your phone away. No, unless you do it. Sort of, you know, what you want to say to them is, all right, put your phone in your bag, right, or in your pocket, or on the, the wardrobe over there, or table over there, all right? Now, they, they might not do either, but they're much more likely to put their phone in their pocket, and you've given them a choice. In a school, classic in a school, so you see a kid, Nicola's got her phone out, she's 16, she's been more, she's got her phone out, she's, she's going to ruin her phone in the back of the class, and she says to Nicola, give me that phone. Nicola doesn't give a flying weather what you think about she is only thinking of what Trisha beside her is thinking about what she's going to do. So what do you do? Give me that phone. It causes a rock. I see it all the time. If a teacher like Ken was doing it, you'd say, right, Nicola, put the phone in your bag or on my table. I'll see you at the end of class. Now, you've given her face time, given her the opportunity to make a decision. She's not going to put it on your table. She's much more likely to put it in her bag. You don't give her the... They are defence lawyers of the future. Don't give them a crowd, OK? And, and the other thing I'd say, the third thing is, like I've already said, it, is don't take anything personally. If they see you taking it personally, it oxygenates them. It's like a... It oxygenates them. And now that is hard when someone is shouting at you and stuff like that. They can say things like, look, I think I wish you could use different language or I'm disappointed in, you know, in, 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 in what you're saying. But who does that come from? <laughs> it comes from you. It's got to be you. You set the mood. You set the mood is up. You want to get the mood down. Right now, there are some and it might not always go. They will sometimes look at you and go that they, they won't always work day one. But oxygen, think of the oxygen mask. Think of who's breathing properly. Think of who's, who's oxygen you're going to like try and reduce. Get them down. Give you a classic thing in a school again. What happens in school? Nicola has told you, Ken, to go fly a kite very high. Who does she get sent to? If I was the head teacher, she gets sent to me. What she'll do is she'll say, tell, tell me to go and fly a kite higher. 
Because you know what happens is you send someone up like that, you don't reduce the anxiety, you increase the anxiety. And what happens is they get excluded, system takes over. What you should do is send them to someone who's, who's a less hierarchical figure. That's why that book is important. That'll get the mood down, you get involved later. You've got to flip it on its head with opposition and fine disorder. You've got to start everything you did with the traditional learner. You've got to think it, you've got to rethink it again and flip it on its head. Oh, that's great. Um, I have to say, Finn, you know, um, when we did our first teacher training, when I uh, was in April 2018 and you came over, um, but I know you've never been in an office, so but that's a very good, accurate presentation the way Nicola wandered around with the phone all the time. Being, <laughs> Nicola, put the phone away. That's, I just, she's I had a thought. She knows it's true. <laughs> I, had a, I just, just don't know, I don't know where it was. It just occurred to me, really. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the only one. I'm the only one doing any work. Don't worry about. Oh, it. Oh, there is that as well. And, and listen, I knew she'd come back at you on that, Ken, as well. You see, that's why I was saying, don't you don't argue with Nicola. You just gonna, we don't. You're not, not going to work out. It's not going to work out. Well, we did actually. One of the criteria we moved off was there just before COVID was, where can Nicola go with the phone? Oh. Where yeah. can we get to the office and Nicola can go with the phone? So, uh, no, a lot of spaces were discounted because they didn't have space for Nicola to walk on the phone. Yeah. The phone. Yeah. <laughs> a separate yeah. corridor for Nicola with the phone. <laughs> Uh, but okay, is this is Nicola Day. Thanks very much. There's a lot of a lot of what we're doing today. In a way, it's kind of back to front of the way. I will say to you, look, the thing with rapport is, you know, if we we because we've done the S and the F, it's only really half of it. You know, your structure and flexibility. You can't create. You can't. You can't impose structure on someone that's had no experience or has, has fallen off the wayside. It is. That's why you've got to get rapport right. You've got to gain their trust again. And that is about communication. It is all about communication. So as I said, we've, we've said already, it's about, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. It's the tone you use. It's the, it's the not jousting with someone is a good jouster. It's listening. You know, listening isn't something I do particularly well, actually. I mean, over here, they, 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 I leave alone. I'm not touching, no, I love Nicola too. She is lovely. I'm not, but I'm saying, <laughs> but over here, you know, I haven't just kissed the Blarney Stone. Some people think I've eaten a bit of it, you know, when they have you do that, really. But listening is your number one skill, actually. And it's a myth that your greatest salespeople are talkers. They're actually not. They're listeners. You know, and active listening is that listening to understand, not listening to reply, which is what most people do. You listen because you speak again. Listening to understand. And, and that works pretty well with people who have been told a lot you know, that someone's now listening to them. And like anger, you say someone's really angry, you can't say someone don't be angry, that makes them more angry. You gotta, at least you gotta understand that they're angry. And if they see you understand they're angry, then you'll be, well, hang on a minute, at least they understand it, they understand I'm angry, does that make sense? And that's when you get rapport. You gotta get rapport, trust, really, before those other things really work. And following on from that, actually, Finn, um, there's a couple of questions here around getting right back to the very basics when a child is actually diagnosed. We have two families here now are going through uh, similar issues around the diagnosis. We've got one family where the child has, he's 12, he's been diagnosed six months ago. He's done his Connors test. He's done the other tests. He's had his assessment. He's diagnosed with ADHD. He probably knows it himself. He's asked the parents twice, has he got ADHD? And they have said no, because they're not ready to confront it. And on the flip side of that, there's a child who does know and he doesn't want to confront it. So it's about open communication, but how can they, how can you help those? Yeah, families? I mean, I think again, like, you know, I don't know, it's, 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 it's funny because over here, once upon a time, it was a stigma. And now it's not everyone almost, it's, it's kind of become very, you know, like dyslexia used to be 20 years ago, stigma, and that's not a stigma now. I think um, I would say, that the term itself is not as important as talking about that you have, you know, some differences in how you react to situations. Again, I, I'm, I'm all for traits these days, not for terms, quite frankly. And I start talking about terms and saying, look, are you having difficulties with, are you being invited to, I don't know, birthday parties? Are you being asked to go to sleepovers? Are you, you know, why do you think that is? And why do you think, what can we do differently about it? Do you think by understanding about how sometimes you don't always think before you react. Is that, you think, something to do? And then 
you might come to the point that oh and then oh i don't know why i do that you might say well there might be a reason why you do that and you might get something age appropriate some tool some book to explain that there are quite a lot of books that i know the americans have written particularly on on how people are different you know and and, and actually not just for children but for siblings i know mike gordon used to have you know quite a lot of books for younger children and one was actually for siblings of you know say my brother's world-class pain so and then you start i suppose looking at you know some of the role models out there who are different and say oh well that person is like that and look how where they are and things but i think each family needs to sort of like obviously feel comfortable with um with i suppose with how they address it with their children but i would you know i, I focus less on terms than traits these days because i think that's more useful really okay and uh, we we'll probably i know we're just a little bit over time but we'll keep going for a few minutes if there is a few questions there we just want to get through so uh we'll just go to trisha for the next one okay so I just lost my questions. Yeah, Trisha, I'm okay. fine. Can I just see see you? Can you can you can you go up a little top? Oh, there you go. I've got all of Trisha now. Okay, so I I have a meeting with the secondary school tomorrow about my son who's starting in secondary school in September. Do you recommend an approach to setting up a relationship with a new school? He only has movement breaks in primary school, so no extra support, and does okay. But emotionally, he reacts badly to criticism and often quickly decides he hates the teacher. He takes medication. What we have no idea how secondary school is going to go, or the, uh, he could love it or hate it. Okay, yeah. Look, I mean, without that, I'm not going to sweeten the pill there. You know, I'm not saying that primary school was always a bed of roses, but secondary school, obviously, you got it's the biggest transition you ever have to make. You know, you got nine teachers, nine different attitudes, nine different responses to, you know, to how people react. So it's it's a big jump. I would be as open as you can about what you think may well be the areas that you know that that you see as as at least an understanding. I think, you know, the 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 the, the short answer to your question is that teachers need to understand that he's got a developmental difference. And I know this might not be what you want to say, but if he, I presume the eleven or twelve, right? It must be eleven or twelve. Is that the same thing over That's there? Twelve. Eleven or twelve? Yeah. Yes. Eleven. Or 12. 12, yeah. yeah, 12. Yeah. Well, I think you've got to say that developmentally, he has the skill set of a nine, eight year old in certain situations, which is why, because he's got a developmental difference, which is why he's going to need more understanding and, and a bit more patience about how he may or may not react in settings. So that area of getting them to understand developmental differences is really important. Now, whether they're up for that or ready for that, I can't, I can't say, but once that penny drops, they'll stop comparing him. Because you see, schools have policies. They have policies to do with teaching and learning and bullying and all that stuff. But they're all set. They're all set for the traditional learners. Does that make sense? So that, and they work for them because they're traditional learners. <laughs> but they don't work for the people who, because they're not set at the right age level. So that's an important one to do. My only other thing just to say early on is that, and this might not be true of your son, but this is something I say to parents a lot. And they always say to me, how do you know this? But children with ADHD get on better with younger and older. So I would be, I would be worrying a little bit about break times and lunch times, non-structured times. And I would be making sure that you at least have told them that, you know, are there options for him to do something else in non-structured times? Because that's when a lot of children, you talk to me about oppositional defiant disorder, a lot of kids go to secondary school, new start, it can work really well. But once they start getting in trouble, that's when the layers of ODD start coming on. And often it starts off in the non-structured times where they end up, you know, getting picked on and lashing out and hitting other kids. Biggest reason for school exclusion in this country is something called PDB, right? Which is not the pay. It's, it's probably undiagnosed ADHD. The second biggest reason is school exclusion is a child assault on another child. That's the same over there. And that usually starts off with someone picking on someone who is different. Does that make sense? And he or she lashes out. He's not premeditated. He gets caught. I was told that before. And that is almost certainly why it, a lot of it is to do with non-structured times. So I would be making them alert about that. Over here, at least, I think we would be, when I talk to parents about secondary school, that's what I advise. I get them to understand the developmental stuff, uh, if they will. I get them, so then they stop, they stop comparing, they get a better understanding. 
because ADHD, like everything else, is a disability. You know, if they had someone going in there with asthma, you know, they, they'd allow him different options of doing stuff during sports or whatever. You know what I mean? So it's the same sort of principle there. But the, the managing or supporting non-structured time in secondary school and at least at least planning for that is pretty, pretty important. Um, one more here. Um, I think it's an issue we've, we've come across before. That any thoughts, um, Karen has a child who um, likes his sugary foods. And uh, basically she's saying there's no treats in the house, um, but he'd eat <laughs> raw chocolate powder just to get the kick or ma maple syrup. Um, and uh, this week he actually had a box of chocolates that was actually bought for another child in the class. So <laughs> it's part of the impulsivity, I'm sure. But um, how do they manage that? Well, I think, like, again, I mean, I, you know, that I, I'm not a doctor. So when it comes to these issues of diet and those sort of things, I, I mean, I think, you know, most of the studies have shown that diet obviously affects mood, it affects behavior. But in most cases, it's not the most significant factor, but it's not going to improve impulsivity and hyperactivity. We know that. So I think, um, I mean, that sounds like something without passing this to someone else. That sounds like someone that you do need some kind of dietary advice, some kind of, you know, dietitian issue. I mean, I don't know if there's substitutes for these sort of things. I mean, I know that, you know, I mean, it's sugar is a sort of a thing, isn't it? That, you know, he likes, obviously likes a taste of it. Is there something which, you know, is, is, but you have four tastes, don't you? Sugar and salt and, and, um, you know, bitter and what's it, what's the other one? Bitter salt taste what's the other one you got four sour you got sour yeah 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 in fact you know it's just quick it's a quick uh, it's a quick fact you know dogs have a hundred thousand times more, more uh, their sense of smell they've only got a sixth by the way of our sense of um of our sense of taste Did you know that which is why when you see a dog eat something what do they always do they lick their nose you see lick their nose so that's a good one just trying to get that across here so your sense is, but when it comes to sense of taste, it's about, it is, I'm being serious for a minute, it's, it's not just through your taste, it's your, it's, your, it's your sense of smell. So I think if it's the sugar, it's the taste, or that is, is really what he's doing. If it's the energy, the buzz he gets from it, then I suppose you'd have to think of other, other ways he can get that sort of buzz and a control sense. But, you know, I think um, I'd be more worried about him stealing, if I'm honest with you in this particular case, because it's a real craving for it and he's stealing, then, you know, there are obviously something more biological there that would need to be investigated, I suppose, and having some substitute for that, you know, because I think it's the stealing that I'm thinking here is the issue. But in most cases, most parents have started off with the dietary stuff and they found that it, it, it doesn't improve things, but it doesn't make it significantly worse. But in some cases it might. So I would be more worried about the actions that he's doing to get the sugary stuff. So if there's some other substitute for that that he could have instead. But let's face it, everyone likes chocolate, don't they, um, Nicola? So, you know. Yep. Take that point. Sorry, th thanks for that. Um, just to say, maybe just two questions before we just wrap up for the night. Um, just one that's sort of a, a more general question that came in there earlier. And they were just talking about developing fairness across um, age ranges within the house. Because an awful lot of people, you know, there's a lot of questions coming in the show. Um, how do we develop this strategy? So I know you mentioned it in the presentation, but maybe just sort of give us a quick recap of the, the main points of developing a strategy to cope with uh, children fairness. with ODD. You mean fairness? Fairness, yes. Fairness, yeah. Okay, well, I've got a couple of points on that. Number one, here's what we have to do. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you an upstream way because fairness doesn't give them the same given what they need. Now, there's a problem. If you give a child particularly a, a different... Okay, so number one, you've got to have a band one. So in band one, there were some non-negotiables. If everyone sees that whether you're ADHD, ODD, EBD, you can't hit someone, you can't have your phones out in class, that's okay. Band two had someone like, I don't know, fiddling in class or, or shouting out occasionally. Okay, now that is not great, but that's a band two. That's flexibility. Now, the reason why teachers don't like to do band two is because they think if they allow band two, Everyone in band, everyone else will then suddenly rise up and there'll be a revolution. That's why they're afraid of it. They're afraid of it. But again, you've got to get this across that, that he is different. And, that be, and because of that, you need to be more flexible on those. Now, the way of doing this 
there's two ways. One, you've got to reach the staff so they understand what neuro flexibility is. And by the way, it's even bigger than that. What you've got to do, your aim over there is not to have every teacher a teacher of ADHD. You've got to get every head teacher, every head teacher to have that mindset that they've got developmental differences in their school. So that's your scope, right? So that's, that's your start for 10. That's what I'm giving you to do tonight. That's your homework. But the other one you've got to do, you could do more simpler than that. You've got to get the other kids in the school to understand neurodiversity. That will do two things. That will minimize bullying because you'll get your bystanders far more proactively involved as opposed to joining in the bully. They might act as more proactive and they'll understand why he or she is being treated differently. And that's, that's, the, that's the game over here. So if I go to schools to do, do a staff session, I will always then, I will always ask to do a, a whole session with whatever set of school I get, because that's, what, that's, that's the game plan. But if you get that across, then people start reacting differently. You know, they start understanding that um, people not, not get the same, they get what they need. I mean, you need, you need a pair of glasses, Ken, to, to see me. You know, Nicola doesn't. You know, for example, it's fair to give you glasses, you know, because you need them. And it's that, that's that mindset we've got to get across. That's your journey, really. Yeah. Unless you've got contact lenses, Nicola, and I don't no, know. No, actually, no, I, I tell you, I tell you honestly, the they're over there. I can't reach them. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 that's why okay. i was tripping there's up a, on the there's questions a, there's another <laughs> term then we haven't really come across tonight that's called l-a-z-y oh yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah we've done a-d-d o-d-d let's do l-a-z-y yeah yeah well thanks um no. just uh, for the very very last one we won't let nick respond because that's only starting an argument um <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> so we just go, go to Thanks, Trisha. Finn. That was great. There's a lot of really positive comments coming through there. Sorry, Ken, I'm talking over you. Yeah. That's not ADHD Troy either. Um, <laughs> to, uh, oh, we go. Right, this, this is what I'll say. So just say the thing is, what if a teenager is not willing to participate in the family meeting to discuss all these new rules and routine? Ah, uh -huh, yeah. Okay, good one. You haven't found the right place to do it. That's the issue. Okay, because, you know, they're, they're onto it. So there's lots of other places to have the meeting. And you might necessarily want to have it just with, you might have a one-on-one -on -one with him. But I would say to you, two places work well. Two things work well for children with ADHD. Number one, sometimes no eye contact. So when they're doodling or drawing or doing something else. Um, and the second thing, and, and there's another one you can have as well. This might, you might think I've really lost my mind now. Sometimes you talk to someone, you want to get them with ADHD to listen to you. You need to have uh, music on the background or even television on the background. Now, you might think the television is distracting. Distracting you is actually cutting out the white noise for them. All right. That's another thing to think about. Now, I say to parents sometimes, children with ADHD, if they're doing homework sometimes, without a computer screen, what they actually work better with, you won't like this because having an iPod, an iPad beside them, playing a film that they know, will help them focus more on what they've got in front of them. Because without that, they're finding other things to do. They need stimulation. The meeting though, you're talking about specifically, movement and no eye contact. Sometimes, you know, best meeting to have in a car, you driving, them sitting in a seat behind you or beside you, that's the conversation then. It's the movement that helps the focus and the no eye contact. And I'm not saying this is your particular son, but what I'm saying is you find a different setting you find a setting that works for them. Because what we know with children with ADHD, they need either, you either need to reduce the stimulation, you need to put more in. That's what helps them focus. And then the other idea of doing it in front of the family could be to do with the fact that, you know, they feel embarrassed or they feel, you know, that they might be the older one and it's the younger one who's two years ahead of them in school already. They don't want to be told this, that, and the other. There could be all sorts of dynamics for that. But I would say you find a different place to get the message across. One last quick one, Finn. Um, something that we've come across again, um, where, especially when the, the guys are coming into teenage years, they get to the point they don't want to take the medication. You know, even yeah. though they're having sleep problems and they don't want to take their medication, they're getting yeah. embarrassed. They're, you know, they're realizing yeah. their peers are noticing the difference as well. Um, how can you help that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think with teenage, when they're younger, they tend to do it. When they're older, they like, they don't like feeling differently. They don't like feeling differently. In fact, what happens, you know, is what they do is they self-medicate. Actually, that's what happens most of the time. They will go into self-medication routes, and they do the same way that. And that's more obviously that's the more that's more trendy and everything else. Look, you can't make someone do something. You know, it's the old way. You can't make them. You can just suggest, if you like, that this is better for them. So I think. You know, I suppose it's a case of what's your return on, on, on doing this? You know, what are you going to get out of it? And, and I think they have to see that. Now, I'm going to say that often I'm a big fan of, of saying that, you know, they, the village raises the child. They won't take it from you, but they might take the same conversation from the football coach or, or from your brother-in-law or your sister-in-law or a neighbour or, uh, or someone at school, pastoral, that they, they are like... And then it's telling it to them why they should do this. Because basically, if you feel quite sparky and you feel quite quirky and someone's saying to you, you shouldn't feel that way because you, you can do better by not doing that. You know, it's a trade off, isn't it? You, know, you, don't, you don't want to feel less if you want to feel that you want to charge around. and Someone's saying you can't do that. You don't feel good about it. And side effects of medication can make you feel a bit, you know, a bit down and stuff. So it's about what you're going to get by doing that. So and as I say, I think that conversation isn't always ones that parents are best bet to do but the danger of but you need to spend some time on that because unfortunately what we tend to find is that you know they often when they still find that because they are unable to suppress some of their impulsive and stuff then you know they they often they often do go to self they often go through you know the, the marijuana route or something like that as a compensate everything so Yeah, I me mean, you can. It's nice, it's nice and quiet, but yeah, I'm mean, Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's gone. Everyone's gone to the you can go to the pub now, can't you? Can you go to the pub? No, not for yet. Oh, we can't. Not yet. We can't go anywhere. No, we can't go to the pub yet. Not Still yet. can't go anywhere yet. No, no, not yet. No. You have to come over here then for a pub and a hug. That's what we were all up for. <laughs> yeah. Or a hug at the pub. No, I, I say I was just having a quick look at the quick poll that we did. So um a lot of people, the very 80% of people gave, gave you a, a, an A or a B mark, which is very good. Um, but one of the interesting things was, you know, how did you find your child got on in this school year? And um, 45% said it was more challenging. Um, and that obviously just, you know, uh, shows how parents and families with ADHD are getting on. Um, and just we just throw out a question just for the fun of it, you know, where are you going on holidays this year? And, um, you know, 13% going abroad, 50% um, has staycation. But twenty-one percent answer to the question: going on holidays doesn't happen for us. So I think that might be an indication that you yeah. know that um, yeah. Yeah. families with uh, children that with ADD and ODD uh, do find it more challenging than yeah. other uh, families. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately, that is 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 very true, and that is why you know, uh, bless them, the support groups. And I think lockdown has been very hard for some families. I know over here, of course, we have you know, the support group, Addis and people like that, where families have communicated with each other. And I'll be honest with you, in the support groups I've been involved with over the years, I, I, or training courses I've done, I've often ended up after this three or four weeks of, of, of finding support groups, because you have another family who knows what you're going through and you have the same understanding. So I think, I think for those families that are really not going away, Ken, I think, you know, joining a support group or, or joining, um, you know, some kind of offer, you know, option that understands your scenario is really important. A problem shared to problem half, so to speak. So uh, I think that's important. The other thing is, though, it is it is interesting how, I don't know, you know, you, you do take some people. Sometimes I, it, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a risk. And I'm not saying that you, you know, if something you feel that it's going to, you know, going to cause them some health and safety issues. But children with ADHD often respond very differently in environments which are not you know building so to speak and i know there's a risk of them running off the, off, off off the hill but also you know they they do find the environment sometimes you know really quite um what works for them you know i mean we've got a bunch of guys up at my wife works at the um surrey wildlife trust and we've got these guys they're called um the tree pirates and you know and, and what they do is they they just do all this stuff with trees and they make them all you know make them all sculptures and everything else and i said to them you know i meet them sometimes and they, you know they're an interesting bunch of lads you know they're dreadlocks and everything else 
but you know, I say to them, you know, what, and they say, oh, you were a school teacher. I said, I hated school and stuff. And I said, yeah. I said, what were you like? So we're all off doing that. You know what it is? It's like, you know, school wasn't for them. It, school wasn't for them. You know, in the old days, they'd have been called scallywags. You know, they were scallywags, what people call them. They just were non-traditional learners. They, they couldn't sit down, but they can do these marvelous other things out there. So all I'm saying to you as parents is that, you know, the school is not right you know it's not the right environment for some people have this learning style and i guess what i'm saying is that and trusting and maybe risking some environmental differences in terms of what you do be it go to the beach or, or go off to the forest or whatever um yeah i mean i know you've got to be health and safety wise but you might well find that they you they react differently a lot of people react differently on the beach you know the beach is theirs you know it all belongs to them you know every the sand is theirs, the shells are theirs, you know, it's, it's very different, you know. Um, okay. well, yeah. Thanks yeah. very much for that, Ben. Um, we could stay here all night, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, we do need to <laughs> you can go down, go down to the beach, go down to the beach in, uh, in, in a scorty. I think it's called black, you know, go down there. You want to see my parents running on the beach. Yeah. yeah we'll show that video for next time. I'm um, just saying in terms of just next time on July the 8th, uh, Finn will be back doing ODD with relationships and resilience. Um, oh, yeah, so we'll do the R's. We'll, we'll do, do the, the R's. Um, so thanks, everybody, for coming along. Thanks to Tricia and Nicola there for doing all the questions. Thank you, guys. And thank just you. say that it's been a pleasant evening. You know, thank you very much for staying in and watching thank the you. webinar, and we'll see you shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank, thank you, you, Tally, as well. Thank Good you. evening, everybody. Get down to the pub for a hug. That's what I think <laughs> when lockdown takes place. Yeah.